Hello everyone. So this is the first of what I hope will be some uh, bi-monthly installments where I break down the latest in foreign affairs. Foreign affairs is the other publication I, sus I subscribe to other than The Economist. In this one we're going to go over think tanks, how the Korean model might be applied to Ukraine, African economies, we're going to talk about India, Palestine, and wrap up with migration. So think tanks. I'm not going to go into any specific detail on this one and by the time I do the next one of these because the um, foreign affairs comes every two months is I'll just have a link to an exhaustive list I have of think tanks. The Korean model. So how do Ukraine and Russia come to peace? Because Vladimir Putin is not leaving, certainly not of his own volition. And he's made uh, various regions heavily reliant on a centralized Moscow, so not a lot of people are going to cross him. You know, the cost of an attempted coup would be pretty high. And his counterintelligence operatives have infiltrated the military. So don't expect anything there either. So this guy, Carter Malkazian, uh, has come up with... Um, I think I misspelled that name. Basically three things. We must be willing to start the talks while fighting. We, they should include the UN and they should be prepared for aid in the future. The, um, so right here is a list of six countries in Africa that have actually had positive economic growth for the last several years. Uh, as you know, unfortunately, there's been a lot of upheavals and a lot of disasters that have happened in Africa. And all of that has, you know, it's caused um, definitely economic lapses. Also, too, you know, you've had some pretty um, brutal government regimes that made pretty poor decisions uh, and infl super inflated some African economies. So it'll be interesting to see what we can learn from analyzing these six. Oh, uh, so India has now become the largest country. When I say largest, I mean by population. And it's a democracy. Now, what's interesting is, although India is definitely a partner of the United States, it is a democracy. Um, it's very, the values of that democracy are going to be very different. You know, India right now, especially under Nahendra Mude, is undergoing sort of this Hindu nationalism movement. I think, um... Narendra definitely sees himself as the head of not just India, but the Hindu civilization bloc, which has very different values to the various civilization blocks around it. You know, uh, certainly an enemy of China, he's got that in common with the United States, but, he, but India also does a lot of trade with Russia and has refused to uh, sanction them or be part of any sanctioning of them over this invasion with Ukraine in the UN. So, last, either the last issue or the issue before that, there was an article published that generated a lot of buzz called the One State Reality. And uh, essentially, the last portion of this Journal of Foreign Affairs was dedicated to responses to that. Now, oddly enough, nobody, nobody points out anything factual that the researchers got wrong in their article. Uh, they just criticize the, the fact that it seems that the author shouldn't accept the one state reality or something like that. Yeah, I think a lot of people, it was just, um, I think one of my friends actually mentioned this. It's just that they said the quiet part out loud. Um, I do like, like this, that uh, one of the researchers pointed out that uh, a lot of the countries have effectively left the Palestinians behind in the dust, so to speak. Uh, there's certainly no part of the Arab Spring really touched on or mentioned the Palestinians. I have this quote, the last time masses of Arab citizens rallied for the Palestinians was never. Uh, one of the researchers mentioned that why it's going to be very difficult for the Palestinians to achieve any of these initiatives is that unlike Israel, they're a bit divided because you've got Palestinians who have now lived for over a generation in the West Bank and Gaza and just want that those areas to be independent. You have the refugees, diaspora, they just want to return home. You've got the urban inhabitants who uh, just want equal rights. And yes, you do still have the hardline 
who you know want Israeli territory back and they want Jerusalem as a capital it's probably going to be even more difficult than any of the other three and Israel on the other hand is an ethno-nationalist state so it's going to be much more unified and it's going to be much easier for is Israel to um, do an objective than it will be to get all the, the Palestinians online to do an objective or in the same line I mean immigration so uh, we've been hearing about the immigration crisis and what it's cost to cities and I've been waiting actually for a really good thorough article that's analytical comes out really addresses this and uh, this is actually um, in the journal it's the one about the border crisis it mentions that recent events in Venezuela Haiti and Nicaragua have led to a huge spike in people coming to the border the thing is is um, the previous administration Trump was just to turn people back and not even detain them and um, well that strategy may have had some good points it actually had some fairly bad ones too because there are definitely smugglers and whatnot uh, who need their names cataloged and uh, you know if they get caught doing this repeatedly they might be traffickers and you need to prosecute them and uh, this is you know um, coming from you know, this expert who really knows this stuff the Biden administration has seemed to let them in under the status of refugees or asylum and the asylum infrastructure is very small and was made to deal with people fleeing persecution generally speaking fleeing a type of political persecution you know uh, so let's say there's been a regime change and you were part of the military the previous regime and they just want to lock you up for that you maybe didn't even do any fighting uh, so the problem is is the system has become flooded and you know uh, the immigrants are allowed to stay in the United States until the asylum case is heard that can be a very long process because it's multi-layered so first there's kind of like the arraignment you know just to see should you be allowed to stay as an asylum seeker it can take months to even do that and then there's the final thing which could take years to come to which is the ruling on you know should you be given asylum this is costing uh, cities very dearly uh, we've seen even Eric Adams a New York politician mayor of New York um, talking about the crisis what's costing them that there's now over a hundred hotels just dedicated to uh, the asylum seekers and what that costs the city how it stressed any of the nonprofit organizations um, also too it talks about the drain on the economy because asylum seekers can't legally work in the United States so I don't know what the answer is unfortunately it, it is going to probably remain a problem for a very long time <laughs>